We're excited that industry is really partnering with us on on having these panels and 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 sharing their experiences. Um, part of being uh, part of WAC is that we get a perspective that not all you not not everyone in industry gets. So so we get to we get to visit a lot of utilities. We get to have conversations with a lot of people, and and we get to we get to learn who's who's having audit success and who's struggling at audit, but. For this um, panel, we really wanted to bring up some folks that have had some audit success and have them share some of their lessons learned and and share what they what they're doing that's working, and really um, be available for questions and sharing. So so thank you all for being here. We appreciate it, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Stacia to uh, moderate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, like Deb said, my name is Stacia Karen, and I've been at WEC for the past um, 12 years. Um, some of the, seven of those years have been with the SIP audit team, and I just recently what, moved into a new position as an entity monitoring manager, focusing on low inherent risk entities. Um, and with me, I have a wonderful panel of industry experts. And I would just like to turn the time over to them to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll go ahead and dive into our um, presentation. Let's go with you, Jenny, first. All right. My name is Jenny Wyke, and I'm with Tacoma Power. I'm Tacoma Power's NERC compliance lead, and so I am the primary point of contact. I lead our audit. Um, some of you may recognize me because I'm also the WICF, New Standard Implementation Focus Group Chair. So part of my job is also monitoring new standards work, validating and commenting. Um, I've been at Tacoma Power for five years, uh, so only NERC experience for five years. Prior to this, I have over 10 years working with commercial nuclear um, compliance. And uh, if you know the name New Scale Power, I was the licensing manager for the design certification application. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Lopez. I work with Arizona Public Service Company. I am a NARC regulatory advisor. I've been with APS for uh, 19 years. It'll be 20 next uh, in 2024, so I'm excited about that. Um, and I am an advisor for operations and planning, and I'm here with um, my leader, Stephanie Little, uh, and happy to be here to share some of our audit success information. Thank you, Stacia. My name is Casey Jones. I'm the manager of ONP compliance at NV Energy. Uh, recently, that was a recent change. Before that, I was the manager of NERC SIP compliance. So Hans and I are going to be speaking to you from the perspective of a SIP audit. Uh, I have 12 years at NV Energy. I started as a student engineering intern, uh, spent about seven, eight years in the ops side, uh, system control, field engineering, and got into compliance work back in 2020. So we appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Hi, I'm Hans Schmid. I'm also from NV Energy, and up until very recently was Casey's chief minion. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I've been with NVNG for about nine years now in a variety of different roles. I started out uh, coming up through the physical security group, uh, and I managed physical security for a while before moving on over to the SIP compliance group. Thank you all for th those introductions. Um, so we have this audit success panel. And one thing that I want to be very clear on is when we are talking about audit success, we are not talking about coming away from an audit with no findings, um, absolutely zero PNCs. We are talking about how do you prepare yourself for a successful, smooth audit experience? How do you prepare your team? How do you communicate? And so what you will learn today during this presentation is you will learn from these industry experts about how to prepare your narratives, um, evidence packaging, working across multiple platforms like the cell and align. Now, I will tell you that um, Casey and Hans are the only two up on this panel that have gone through an audit where they have used cell and align. So they will speak to that towards the end of it. But um, Jessica and Jenny have fairly recently gone through an audit as well. Um, they just used the old method that we that we had prior to that. Um, and we will just cover best practices that will help you succeed at audit. So the first thing that we want to talk about is the audit and readiness assessment. So one thing as we were talking about prior to this presentation when we were developing it was I was kind of surprised by how early you guys get started in your audit pre 
prepared, like being prepared for audit, and it was different across the board. So could you please talk a little bit about more about that? Um, let's start with you, Jenny. Yeah, thank you. We actually start our audit preparations 18 months prior to the start of the WEC audit. Um, our previous WEC audit was October of 2022. So as Stacia mentioned, we were prior to Align. I think we were one of the last entities to go through using like the WEC workspace. Um, we're very thankful for that. Um, so we, we start 18 months prior to the start of our audit. Um, and actually, our next audit will be spring of 2024, so time flies fast, and I'll be starting on our next audit prep in a couple of months here. Um, we utilize peer mock audits for preparation. That's why we start so early. Um, we use and leverage WICIF for participation. Um, I think we had 40 or so um, external entities for our last peer mock audit. We did it all virtually. So we didn't have anyone travel. It worked really well, helped us prepare for our audit, but it does take time. So that's why we start 18 months before. Um, we do have our mock audit roughly nine months to a year before the WEC audit. That allows us to address any recommendations or issues that might be identified. It also helps us self-report any PNCs before the audit starts. It's really important for entities so you can get credit for that self-report. Make sure you're identifying your issues if you are going to do a mock or peer audit ahead of time. Um, I also want to note as we put on this slide, there's actually lots of ways to do mock audits. I, I love Tom's, you know, session using the work of others. Great idea going forward. Maybe it'll leverage for future WEC audits in your scoping. Um, but you can use internal peers, say SME to SME in different areas. You can contract with third party consultants. Um, we used, again, WICF external peers and reached out that way. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, and it's on the slide, is maintaining your regional evidence tools on a periodic basis. Um, don't wait until you get the audit notice to start, say, working on your SIP ERT. Um, we at Tacoma Power um, maintain our ERT uh, throughout the year. We do internal audits on that content. And so um, when we have our audit roll around with WAC, we already have it understood how are we going to populate it, where the data is coming from, who's providing that data. Um, really recommend figuring that out before you get the audit notice. And for APS, I'll just add a few uh, differences. And uh, similar, we do uh, plan ahead about a year in advance of the audit. We do utilize an internal uh, audit procedure that identifies uh, roles and responsibilities within our internal compliance team of who uh, manages uh, each item, whether it's logistics, communications, um, interview, subject matter expert uh, preparation, uh, as well as uh, the SIP, uh, SIP ERT aspects of it. Uh, we also uh, performed uh, or utilized an external third party as a part of our preparation efforts, um, as well as maintaining the SIP ERT information as well. So um, a lot of what uh, Tacoma does is what we at APS also do. Thank you. Um, it's it's interesting to see the overlap of what you guys are doing, um, but then also the differences that come from preparing for audit. So uh, just so you all know, I am not excluding Casey and Hans. They have a bigger part in this presentation a little bit later on, but let's go to the next slide. And it is audit logistics. So I will say that I was the SIP ATL for Jenny's audit, um, just your previous one. And Jenny, you are kind of a master at coordinating things. Um, so I definitely want to get your take on this, but let's start with Jessica on this one. Audit logistics, what does APS do? Yeah, so audit logistics for us, um, we actually had our audit uh, last December, and um, like many others, uh, we were not aware of what uh, what method it was going to be, whether it was going to be remote, in-person, hybrid. So we kind of planned for it all. But as a part of the audit logistics, what we did is we reserved conference rooms, multiple conference rooms in advance um, for meetings and trainings um, and the actual audit. But we also had to uh, identify the conference rooms that we were going to utilize and the technology associated to it because that was a big challenge within itself in that each conference room had different resources and they were operated differently and that was quite a bit of a challenge because 
uh, not everything operated the same. So what we did is we identified the conference rooms, res reserved them, I and tested the technology, and then captured how how we utilize that technology. That way, come audit time frame, we understood this is the room and then this is how it's operated and how it functions to help us ensure that everything runs smoothly. Um, we also uh, coordinated in advance with leadership on subject matter experts uh, availability. That was key for uh, any interviews or potential interviews that could arise. So uh, ensuring that we prepare with those leaders uh, in advance is, uh, to ensure that their folks are gonna be available. Um, we also, uh, participated in WEC workshops, and as we were going through our preparations and audit logistics, we had a live uh, lesson learned document so that we can always reference at a later later time, so. Great, and I think it's gonna be very similar between Jessica and I throughout all of our slides, because a lot, when we were preparing this, all three of us were like, we all do very similar things. So, you know, reserving conference rooms, we had a hybrid audit. It, we did have on-site visits, but a lot of the interviews were conducted virtually. Um, but we also had staff that was on-site, remote, and a mix. And so, to be conservative, we did reserve conference rooms. And I will emphasize, yeah, understanding the technology in each of those conference rooms and doing a test run, highly recommend. Um, you know, coordinating again with SMEs and management to ensure their availability, especially for the on-site visits. Um, we did do a little bit of extra reach out to Stacia because we had a SIP on-site visit and we we're like, what days are you coming? <laughs> again, what days are you coming? So we could make sure that we had the right people in place. And we actually did um, substation and hydro plant tours as well. So that was additional staff that we had to coordinate with. Like we had safety come in and give them a debrief. Um, we also had plant hydro managers that we coordinated with. So additional folks that you should be thinking about with those on-site visits and coordinating their availability, especially if they're used to working remote, not in the office. Um, documenting lessons learned, I cannot emphasize that point enough with Jessica. Like have a document ready at the very beginning that's just gonna collect any of those opportunities, suggestions, improvements, because let me tell you, by the end of it, you're gonna forget that thing that went wrong with the ERT when you're preparing it, right? And you're gonna thank yourself <laughs> that you wrote down that frustration so you don't repeat it for the next audit. Um, also, one thing that helps us with audit logistics like Tacoma Power is we keep a very detailed checklist of everything that we do. We just write it all down, every little thing that we do to prepare. So reserving the conference rooms is on there. Testing interconnect, internet connection. We even tested cell phones. So we had different people come in with different carriers on their cell phones to make sure that the rock auditors, if they were on site, would have cell phone service. So just like those little things, little detailed things, put on a checklist and save it somewhere, like in your content management system, so you can use it for the next rock audit. It makes it a whole lot easier. I, I love that. I know the audits can be stressful as it is. And so testing the technology beforehand um, kind of alleviates that. So I appreciate that advice. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide, which is a communication plan. Um, as you are coming up on your audit, how do you address communications internally? And Jenny, let's start with you on this one. Ooh, our favorite topic, communication. You can never communicate too much. So take any communication that you have in your mind and take it times three. Uh, communicate in all different methods and ways, meetings, email notifications. We created a SharePoint site, a page that was dedicated just to audit material. So on our page, we would have, for example, compliance point of contacts. Obviously my name and picture was on there as well as my, my cohorts that were helping me. Audit scope was there, our assignments for each of the standard requirements or subject matter expert assignments were on there. We had all of our schedule milestones. We made very bright and colorful pictures highlighting when all the deadlines were for SAWS, ERT, et cetera. 
We had live dashboards tracking the preparation of our RSLs. So as we completed our tasks and the workflows, it would auto update on the page and you could see where the RSLs were in the review and approval process. Super helpful. You have one page to go look at to see that status. Um, we did a similar thing with RFI responses where you had a live dashboard in there as well. And then links, most importantly, to your documentation libraries. So we ensured all of our evidence, our RSAs, we used RSAs because we were in the line. Um, we made sure that was all in one place for our subject matter experts to find. Um, this was all part of our communication plan, believe it or not. So we have a detailed, again, communication plan that we use every audit. We start out with that and then revise it make it more applicable. So in there we have a line item for creating a SharePoint site to have and we go even to those bullet details of this is what the SharePoint page needs to have on it. Um, we do that communication plan about a year ahead of time is when we start working at it. Um, it identifies all of our stakeholders who needs to be communicated with, what we're going to communicate to them, how, right? Is it going to be emails? Is it actually going to be to posters that we put around the office, because we do that as well to make sure folks know that WEC is going to be on site for the audit. Um, we also, you know, go into details of like providing daily updates during the two week audit period. And we're going to say, okay, those daily updates are going to come from this person. It's going to be an email. It's going to include RFI status, key issues, the WEC status table, which we'll talk about later. That was a really great that I could copy from Stacia. Um, and then any highlights from the day's activities, like we explicitly call out kudos to staffs, like recognition in each of our daily updates. Um, also really important in your communication plan to establish milestones for when those communications are going out, when there's deadlines for your evidence. Um, meet with your audit stakeholders. Don't just talk within compliance. Ask them what's important to communicate. What is all the work that they're doing that needs to be captured? And then also again, <laughs> Post your communication plan in multiple places, emails, meetings, audit page. Thank you, Jenny. And Jessica, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Ditto. <laughs> Everything she said, ditto. No, we um, similar, and I won't uh, reiterate, uh, but similar, you can't, there's no such thing as um, overly communicate when it comes time to audit. Everyone is well aware and informed through SharePoint. Uh, SharePoint sites um, and multiple meetings, uh, a lot of opportunity for subject matter experts to ask questions to us so that we can help um, them understand um, and have an awareness and and just the stress, the importance of their participation and engagement throughout the whole thing. So. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I know that when we're talking about the communication plan, we're talking about like the internal communication plan, but I cannot emphasize enough that if you are feeling lost, if you are feeling um, you just don't know where to begin with an audit, please, please, please reach out to your ATL, um, your audit team lead. That is one of their responsibilities is to guide you through the, through this audit, get the information that we need from WEC and to help you kind of feel more at ease. Um, we know it's an audit, but we don't want it to be painful for, for the entities. Let's go to the next slide and we're going to talk about interview preparation. Now, I know interviews can be extremely um, anxiety inducing. I know that even for me, when I'm conducting an interview, I like pace around my house a little bit before the interview starts. It really confuses my dog, but it's just to get the, the nerves out. Um, and so I would like to hear what you guys have for interview prep. And let's go ahead and start with Casey on this one. Thanks, Stasha. <laughs> so um, at NV, we had our, our audit in March of this year, and we started, uh, initially we retained external consultants as part of a mock audit uh, about seven months prior. And uh, we, as part of that mock audit, we provide, we, we did an ERT and then we had uh, all of our SMEs as part of the interview. Uh, one thing we found during that interview was that we brought way too many SMEs, way too many people to the table to make it effective, especially on the SIP 7 side, the SIP 10 side, where you might tend to have a lot of SMEs. Um, and so about four weeks before our official audit, we had another um, external firm come in and provide another mock interview uh, where we really trimmed down the size of those audits to the essential SMEs and the compliance staff. And so that really gave comfort to uh, our team specifically, who are the owners and co-owners of the standards, as well as any SMEs who might be participating. Um, as we were really going through the questions, what to expect, the process, 
and then just general guidelines about whether or not you need to caucus and um, really procedural basis. One of the things we did that Nevada that was really helpful and it, it was a suggestion from Hans from his previous career in physical security was uh, WEC has a controls guidance and common failure points for most of the SIP standards and several of the OMP standards on their website. And so we went through those documents and provided answers internally within our group for all of the SIP and scope standards. And that really helped us get into the mindset of thinking about questions less procedurally and more about an internal control because the questions are all internal control basis. And um, that was very helpful for our team because several of the questions that we had prepared for uh, were asked directly within our audit. I, I would say probably 90% of the questions in an interview were internal control based, were, in, were based on internal controls. Um, we also prepared for both uh, a hybrid and remote interview. We, at Nevada, we're, we're split across Las Vegas and Reno, so we brought everybody to Las Vegas to participate in an on-site portion. Um, so we preferred to have everybody that was going to participate in the interview in the same room. Um, one thing we did on Teams is we created a, a, a private Teams chat that we could use as a kind of a private caucus during the interview. So if somebody was presenting uh, during the interview and a, a colleague sitting next to them had a thought, they could provide that within the Teams chat. We could flush it out right there without having to do an official stop and caucus. Uh, genius. That's a good idea. Um, Jenny, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I do know. <laughs> um, one thing to emphasize is having that chat feature, whatever platform your company uses, anticipate that and have that available. We actually, for every, I know this is getting ahead to the next slide, but there's RFIs for interviews. And so oftentimes we would create a Teams chat and name it for the RFI that would be related to the interview. And then that way that would be used to even exchange messages in preparation for the interview prior and then use it during the interview. And that also, again, getting the next slide in RFIs, that helped with RFI preps too, because you could share a lot of information if there was multiple subject matter experts working on a response. So that's a really great tip to have that established. We also uh, found that 30 minutes prior to our interviews, we would get everybody either in the room together. Us, it was mainly virtual. We did have an on-site portion, but a lot of our interviews were virtual. So we would just do like a, a pre-job brief 30 minutes before virtually with all Tacoma Power people. And we would talk about the evidence related to the standard for the interview. If there were any RFIs, we'd refresh on what our responses were. And then we would also clarify who's going to speak on which of the topics and also very importantly, who's going to share their screen. Is there anything you'd like to add, Jessica? Yeah, so for APS, um, we were, um, once we received our preliminary uh, standards and requirements and scope, we then identified uh, working with the business units, the primary subject matter expert and a backup subject matter expert um, in the event that the primary wins the lottery and moves away. So we always have someone as a backup. But once we identified those subject matter experts, we did provide a uh, just-in-time training to those uh, primary and backup subject matter experts and what we did is we provide them training with just uh it's a phase two uh, a part a phase one was just general you know what could they expect when meeting um uh with an auditor and how to uh communicate if they're not sure they can always take a step back it's like an interview right not everybody feels comfortable interviewing and so just providing them with some tips and comfort to help them um respond and be uh, prepared and aware of what to expect. Phase two was mock interviews. And so what we did for those is we actually, uh, we utilized a conference room and we had everyone, subject matter experts, our internal compliance, legal, come in in person and uh, we identified which room we were going to utilize. And then we actually had uh, leadership uh, in another room to kind of uh, conduct like a, 
uh, virtual interview. So it was to test the technology and also uh, to prepare the subject matter expert so that they were familiar with, you know, what to expect in, in the event that they were asked to interview. Similar to Tacoma, we actually also identified who is going to be, you know, running the documents, the evidence, um, and, you know, what steps to take in the event that, you know, this me was not sure how to respond. So um, a lot of practice just to, you know, again, prepare this me so that they're comfortable, because I don't know about you, but interviews aren't always fun. And so you just want to help uh, bring comfort and just for those subject matter experts. Yeah, um, for as as an auditor, interviews are extremely important to us to help un for us to understand how well your SMEs know their material, um, and also just to pull out internal controls from your processes because we've noticed that a lot of entities don't have their internal controls documented within their plans, procedures, processes, um, and so interviews are so important to us to identify and to talk through your controls and how they are designed and how, if they are implemented, um, how you wanted them to be implemented. Um, interviews are very valuable to the audit teams. Um, moving on to the next slide, requests for information. Let's go ahead and start with you, Jenny, and talk about any requests for information best practices you have. Yeah, I already mentioned creating a dedicated Teams chat or other platform chat just to have communications as you're working on an RFI response. But also what's really important is assigning someone who's a dedicated RFI data request coordinator. And it's their primary job to track the status of all of your, your RFIs or data requests. Um, we at Tacoma Power actually leverage an automated tracker tool. I've presented on it before at Wicked Forums. Um, we use Smartsheet. Um, that saves so much time. Um, an automated tool like that or a workflow sends out reminders for you. Uh, recommend looking ahead of time at your audit processes and going, what can I automate here? Like, what are the manual communication processes that just don't need to happen and take up a lot of my time? Like, for example, like a reminder that, hey, your RFI response is due tomorrow. You can totally automate that. You don't have to be sending out those emails yourself. Uh, also, have a written RFI process that you've reviewed and trained your stakeholders on. So we create a detailed step-by-step -step flow chart that identifies, you know, when do the supervisors and managers get to review it and approve it? Because sometimes they get involved too early and they review a response before it's done. Um, so just really making sure they all understand the process, who sees it when, when you'll get notified, how to document your completion. We did digital signatures for our RFI responses, which was great for remote working. I think we would all nod and say that we'd use digital signatures these days. Um, we also used our tracking tool again, thinking to yourself, like, what can I take that I do manually and automate? We had our RFI response templates completely automated. So in my tracking tool, I would put in all of the information on the RFI, right, who was asking it, when does it do, the text of the request itself, and then I would hit a button and it would auto-generate my template. Just like that. So I wasn't having to manually copy and paste or format or worry about any of that stuff. And then also when it generated that template, it would automatically send out a notification to all the, the impacted stakeholders that I had put in there. And so within seconds, um, I had completed what would have been a 30 minute to an hour task, right? So really think down and look at your processes, write them out and look at all those little areas where you do manual communications or manual actions and ask yourself, is there a way to make this easier? And for APS, the only thing I will um, add is uh, we did have a risk, um, a, request, a data request coordinator, and they also utilized templates. Um, the one addition um, that I will say is that we did do mock data requests with subject matter experts um, and also utilized a SharePoint site to track uh, status so that everybody was aware of due dates and whose um, who's queue it was in uh, and you know where it was so that there was transparency uh, as well as just, again, practice for the subject matter experts as well as our teams to vet and, and perform the process. Thank you. 
I forgot to mention really important on the dashboards. We also looked at say burn down curves of how are we performing with our RFI responses? And we had kind of a backward looking metric to see if we were submitting them on time and how early. Um, so that's really great because so often you think of the negative of like missing deadlines, but don't forget to pull out the positive and take credit for that and give the kudos to your SMEs who finish things days early and build that into your metrics so you can point that out. Just gives everybody warm fuzzies in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next slide and we're going to talk about compliance narratives and evidence collection. So when we're talking about compliance narratives, it is what we used to call RSA narratives. So we're talking about what we used to put in the RSA and now what we put in a line, we're just going to call it compliance narratives for that purpose. But um, moving on here, Jessica, do you have any best practices for compliance narratives? Uh, the biggest goal for our SAR compliance narratives is to ensure that they uh, demonstrate compliance and assist in reducing RFIs. That's the goal, whether it's uh, written and in your evidence form as, as well as you, in your interviews. Um, you want to be as clear and concise and uh, eliminate any need for additional RFIs. Um, what we do at APS is we do an ongoing uh, review of narrative and evidence uh, of our saws. I'm sorry, we're, it's going to take some time. No, it's okay. I just wanted it's to take a lot of time. No, go ahead. But we do do ongoing reviews and we work uh, with the business units. Although there are so many different standards and requirements, we do about 25 to 30 percent. Uh, reviews and we work with the business units uh, to completely uh, evaluate and assess um, where they are so that they're audit ready. Um, so that's one thing that APS does. Um, we also, uh, we, we utilized a third party consultant to as assist us in our RSA reviews prior to um, our actual audit, uh, as well as, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We just want to make sure that uh, it's concise and easy to follow and read. Yeah, perfect. Jenny, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, actually, to make sure everybody is still awake, I have a question for you. <laughs> okay, so we all know we're moving to a line and there's a lot of questions of our saws or no our saws. What are they, what are they doing? So a question for all of you, who would be happy to see our saws go away? Raise your hand. <laughs> Oh, oh. Who, who would be sad to see Arsa's go raise of hands? Okay, everybody who didn't raise their hand, you're just sleeping. Thanks. Okay. Just checking. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you named this like compliance narrative because honestly, it's not going to change, right? You're still going to have to describe how you're compliant. My word of wisdom, and this is what we use a lot in our training, is the goal of your narrative is to effectively demonstrate compliance and assist in reducing RFIs and interview questions. You are helping the auditor. You are showcasing the work that you're doing. This is your opportunity to explain to WEC all the great things that you're doing. The one caveat I'll add is we do not include internal controls in our, our narratives. We've had a lot of debate on that internally. I know WICF, it always comes up as well of do you or don't you include internal controls? We decided not because we didn't want to duplicate the ICDCT. Um, I won't get into anything else in my talking points because we're short on time, but I will say one interesting conversation that I had today is do you or don't you use chat GPT to prepare your RSA narratives? <laughs> dun, 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 to be investigated later. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, let's, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And this, Hans, is your time to shine. With the SIP ERT, please bless us with your knowledge. Yeah, so the SIP ERT, it was really our first time using this. And uh, I'm actually a huge fan. Uh, I'm going to turn about half the crowd against me when I say that our saws are dead and I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> but, the, <laughs> uh, but being able to look at this from a different perspective was a lot. Uh, uh, 
a lot more concise in the way that we are able to answer things uh, and really help drive that. Your ERT, uh, we did the our mock audit with our ERT because we knew that we were planning on doing this. So we, uh, we had a third party consultant come in and we botched it. We could not have done a worse job during our mock audit preparing the ERT and preparing evidence. And uh, they came in and were like, the, this is terrible. I don't know what you guys are thinking. Uh, but it was awesome because we were able to really uh, drive in how it is we wanted to do this. So uh, for the ERT, you have everything. And it made our audit, our actual audit, so much easier because we were able to refine all of our level one data requests, all of our level two data requests. We knew exactly what they were going to ask. It's in the ERT. It's great. So your level one, it's all procedural. Uh, so you can prep all of your level one. If you've got a pretty good idea of what's going to come up in audit, you, you can have your level one done before you even get your notice of audit. And you're just packaging that up and sending it out. It's all procedural. Level two, you have the templates. And all that's going to change between a mock audit and a real audit for level two is your data set. All right, that, that's it. If you have everything laid out, how you want to present evidence, what evidence files you're going to generate, you already know exactly what you're going to do before you even get to audit. We spent dozens of hours of overtime during our mock audit, and our audit was real easy. We just filled in what we had already created during the mock audit. Uh, so with all of those things provided, we, had a, we scoped what we thought our audit was going to be pretty well. So a lot of the work was done for us. Uh, for the uh, actual submission, uh, we we got everything in pretty quick, and then we were expecting uh, RFIs to come in uh, after that. We didn't really hear anything after that. We had thought that we were going to get them like, uh, you know, a few days after. Because when we uh, sent in our level one, uh, we got our data set back within like two days, uh, and then we immediately started working on that. Um, so we just reached out to, to WEC at that point uh, when we thought we were supposed to get more RFIs. Uh, and that's when we found out and it's like, they're on like week seven of back to back to back to back audits. And like, they, they're just, there's not gonna be any RFIs prior to them coming to our audit. So it, it's one of those things they'll tell you, but you know, it, if you're expecting something you're not getting in, just ask and they'll tell you. They were really good about that. Thank you, yeah. Any other comments on the SIP ERT before we go to the next slide? Okay, um, this next slide. Okay, so Hans provided me this example and I'm gonna let you talk about it, but then I'm gonna talk about why it is so helpful to the auditors. So go ahead, Hans. Yeah, so this is one of the things that we kind of refined. So this is uh, just a level one request that we had. The level one uh, data set is really straightforward. It, it's, and level, level one is really what's your process and level two really comes down to prove that you're doing it. Uh, so for the level one, we all we would do is we we really would just say, this is what it is, this is what we're responding to, the specific uh, the specific item from the ERT itself. So sub six R one L one oh one, those get real confusing when you've got a whole bunch of them in the audit and you're throwing all that up. R's and L's and ones out there, uh, it, it gets to be a lot, but that's why we have folders. Uh, and then we just restate the question, because really what we are looking to do is make this as easy on WAC as possible to really see what we're trying to do. So we just restate immediate, immediately after that, what is that question asking? And then our measures, how do we do this? So in this case, all it's asking for is a procedure, and they want to see where in our procedure uh, we state we're doing this, uh, where we answer this particular question. So we're able to cite that specifically and then send that uh, along with, in this case, uh, two pieces of supporting evidence and we call it good. Yeah, so this is a this is a pretty simple example, and we have a different, more complex example on the next slide that Hans will go over. But one of the reasons why this is so extremely helpful to the auditors is you can provide us all the data that you have, um, which is great. That's what we need. But if we don't have like a roadmap, we're going to have so many interview questions. We're going to have so many follow up RFIs. So this is this what what Hans provided in his in his audit was so extremely um, helpful. And I also will mention that in every single, so I looked at the data for every single one of their audits. And um, after using the ERT, the, the previous audit 
from the ERT to the audit after the ERT was implemented, the DRs increased, decreased, sorry, decreased dramatically. That's what our goal is for this, the ERT, um, is to decrease those um, RFIs and just streamline the evidence. So Hans, I'll go ahead and let you explain this more complex. Yeah, and this is a more complex one. And the uh, and the, the RFIs are a good point too. I and mean, we, we went from, we probably, so for this audit that we just had, we probably had a 10th of the RFIs that we had in our previous audit. And of those uh, RFIs they've got, most of them are for interviews. Uh, and we, we had a handful, they, they, we were nervous the entire time. Like, we're, we're not getting RFIs, uh, but you know, we, we had spent a lot of time preparing these. So uh, this is a SIP 10 uh, level two request. So it's gonna be a little bit more data heavy. Uh, and, and that's just true for uh, level two. Some, some of the standards are really easy, but SIP 7 R2, SIP 10 R1, SIP 4 R4, like those are gonna be heavy and crying as part of the process. Uh, <laughs> but well, once we had that roadmap laid out, uh, it, it was really easy from there. So we, again, we laid out the question of exactly what you're asking for. There's a sample set date, which for us was typically, you know, what did you do in the previous year? Here's our entire sample that you asked for and all of our assets and what we think is applicable for that, all the uh, the columns from our ERT that really mattered. And then we start talking about it. So our narratives in the very beginning, uh, as our consultants told us, I, I believe the polite word is verbose, uh, but we really had to look at those and trim those down considerably and really make sure we're answering the questions because we're, a lot of us are in the RSA mentality, uh, Casey and I in, are included, where you're, you're talking about a lot of stuff, you're throwing everything out there. These are, these are focused questions. So what might have taken three pages to explain is, you know, two and a half paragraphs. Uh, and in that, we just describe what evidence we're presenting in this case. Um, and really laying it out. So the, the table that follows at the at the very bottom, and we're providing uh, for the request number three, and this is your asset ID. Uh, this is the, the patch. This is when we installed it. This is how we're proving this is when we installed it. Uh, the, the last time it was updated, and we, we lay these files out, and we specifically say this, uh, these are all the things that are in scope that are on our, that, uh, are in our documentation, and this is the evidence. And really pointing uh, WAC to be able to just, you know, really check on everything and in a very quick manner, especially coming after, coming off of uh, six prior weeks of audit, we really wanted to make this as easy for them as possible. Uh, and and this, was, this was our way of laying it out in a way that we thought made sense. We went through a few iterations uh, not only with consultants, but internally, where everybody's like, yes, this is very intuitive. I don't need any special understanding of NV Energy in order to be able to follow this. Yeah, it's a really good example of how preparation before the audit can really make the audit less stressful and decrease those RFIs. Okay, like I said at the top of the presentation, um, NV Energy is the only um, participant up here that's gone through a line and sell an and align a cell audit. So Casey, can you just give us a little bit of insight of what you guys experienced during that? Yeah, great. So uh, Brenda Compton participated on the panel earlier, the Align Success panel, and did the whole panel did a great job uh, expressing the positives and some of the downturns with Align. Um, my team, uh, we this was our first audit experience in, a, in an oversight role. And so we had no experience with uh, web CDMS. So we came in, we came to it with fresh eyes. Um, and truly, we, we had really no major issues. Um, at the start of our notice of audit, we had training, as the panel expressed earlier. Um, so uh, Jessica King uh, provided that training to us and uh, really was a great insight. I had never used a line before, uh, got on to do the training and didn't have access. Um, so. We just recommend, you know, get on early, uh, utilize that training from the WEC and NERC staff, and if you have any issues, get those resolved quickly. So we did that about October, about six months before our official audit. Next day I was back in, I had access. Um, uh, in addition, uh, we 
we had the compliance narratives. Uh, as Hans was saying, at Nevada on our SIP side, we're, we're really trying to get away from our saws going fully to the ERT. And so we were narrowing down our R saws specifically to match what the ERT had requested. And so we were trimming those down um, and uploading them into the working papers of a line. Uh, we didn't have any issues with that. One thing we had noted though, and I think you guys talk about it as well in a line is there is some difficulty doing a copy and paste, uh, getting all of that dictation, any bolds, italicies, those will not come across. So be careful if you're gonna provide a uh, copy and paste from your RSAs that you're aware that there is some difficulty there in the copy and paste. Um, another thing we noted was that the working papers in a line will ask you for the entire requirement. So we had SIP 10 R1 as part of our recent audit. And it says, how do you comply? What is your narrative for SIP 10 R1? And we're saying, well, there's, there's six sub requirements. I'm not going to copy and paste and hope that the audit team can can find this. So we went through and tried to delineate as much as possible within the working papers. This is 1.1, this is 1.2, um, to try to make it easier for the audit team. So that was one thing I think we had recommended as an improvement that if you have these large requirements with sub requirements, then potentially try to delineate between the two. Um, we did have a couple issues with secure evidence locker with file size, where we had a 40 meg limit. We had to break those up to upload them. Um, we also, we had noted that anytime you submit data, especially during your audit engagement, you should notify your audit team lead. Um, we would always save when you, when you upload data in SEL, you'll get an email return uh, with confirming the submission as well as the individual data files as part of your submission. So we would save those. There was a couple times during the audit engagement where the, the audit team would request that we submit the data and we'd say, well, we submitted that two hours ago and they'd go in and find it. So the recommendation is anytime you submit data to, to notify your audit team. Um, the other issue that we came across and we, we, noted, we noted it early was that SEL has a character limit within the file name. Um, being a compliance team, we love long names on files and I think it was a 50 character limit and we hit that on almost every file. It's kind of embarrassing to say. So uh, quickly in the process, we realized that and we created a new naming format so that we wouldn't hit that 50 limit. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Any any other comments on a line or cell? Okay, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Sasha, I just, um, we did have downtime in a line during our audit engagement. Um, and that was scheduled, I think, a day before. And so we knew that, we saw it coming. And so we notified the audit team saying, hey, we see a line's gonna be down from two to six. Uh, we do have a submission coming in in RFI. Uh, we're gonna submit that. SEL was not down at the time, just a line. So we'd say, look, we're gonna be submitting our evidence package to SEL and we will close out the RFI once a line's back up. So that was, I think, the only downtime we experienced was right at the end of our audit engagement. Yeah, um, I will reiterate that you cannot over communicate enough with your audit teams, especially with your audit team lead. So please, if anything arises like that, um, reach out to them. Okay, we are we are almost done. We wanted to talk about the relationship that um, is built when you have these audits. So I, I'm just gonna turn to you, Jenny, and just talk about your experience with the audit team and but the relationship that was built during this audit. Yeah, I think actually the opening presentation this morning from Steve Noss was really great. I'm gonna steal it, which is your interaction with WAC as a partnership. How can we get the information to them that they need to do their jobs? Go into it with a really positive interaction. Uh, one item, I won't steal the thunder from the rest of them, but lunch with WEC team on your on-site visits. Something as small as that can really build a relationship, give time to help them understand the integrity of your team, that they take things seriously. You can chat over, in our case, some burgers where it was cash only in the middle of nowhere. It was wonderful. Um, I heard rave reviews. I didn't get a burger myself. But anyway, just think of like those little things, positive interactions you can have with the staff, your people as well. The audit team leads, uh, we, we during APSR audit, um, we appreciated the audit team leaves uh, 
providing a status for each of the requirements and scope uh, through a daily debrief meeting. That was very helpful. Um, they did display what was being discussed. Um, we did not receive a, a document, um, which would have been nice, but those discussions were very helpful with us um, in understanding, you know, where they're at, what, you know, what could be coming down the pipe. So we did really appreciate those discussions. Um, we also um, appreciated WEX uh, flexibility. So um, in the event that we were provided or uh, we received an RFI and we were not able to uh, respond due to um, resources, human resources, um, we did uh, work with WEC and they extended those uh, dates and we were, you know, we appreciated that greatly. It was very helpful for us. So, um, and also the lunch with WEC during the on-site visits, uh, it really was helpful and, and, and them learning uh, through our subject matter experts uh, how uh, our, our organization complies with, um, you know, a standard or requirement or just, just in general understanding our process. Perfect. Casey, is there anything that you want to add or Hans? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think I would just like to say we appreciate it and the, the culture of openness that we saw within our last WEC audit. Um, this was our first official audit, uh, Hans and I, but we had always come from a place hearing from our company that you do not talk to a WEC auditor. If they are on site, you do not talk in the hallway. You don't use the same bathrooms. It is a, it is a, it's a wall and we are the entity and they are the regulator. Um, and not to say that they're the enemy, but you would almost feel that anything you say can and use against you. And so uh, we had a hybrid uh, audit uh, as well. And so uh, we had the team out for a SIP6 site visit. And um, we were almost stunned when Josh Rowe, our audit team lead, said, hey, you guys want to get lunch tomorrow after a substation visit? And we had to look at the SIP senior manager and be like, oh, no, I don't think we can do that. Yeah, you know, like, uh, we can't sit down and break bread together. But we said, you know what, let's go ahead. And it was really a great opportunity to get to know your 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 regulators and get to know the WEC team. And, um, you know, we were still cognizant that, hey, this is an audit engagement. And you're not going to be talking about, you know, things you shouldn't be talking about with a regulator, but in an open environment and you can get to know somebody and create more of a culture of uh, we're here to help and we're here to improve your controls. So we really appreciated that. Um, and Stasha, I'll go ahead. One of the things that was requested during our, our audit was a virtual demonstration. And so we had SIP 7 R2 and as part of our RFI, um, Josh Rowe said, hey, we would like to see a virtual demonstration of your mitigation plan process. It's not really coming through well on paper. Um, and so we, we we talked internally and said, well, why don't we go ahead and just share our screen tomorrow in the interview and provide a walkthrough of our entire SIP 7 R2 program. Uh, we feel like we had good controls, a lot of great automation. And so as part of that, as part of that interview, we, we took the first 30 minutes and walked through our patch management patch source program. And um, we really appreciated the opportunity to do that. I think that was something that changed from three years prior with our previous audit where it was, we will not show anything unless requested. Uh, we would have interview prep where we, you do not respond to something unless officially requested and you only answer the question. Where this year we were saying, hey, I know you asked about mitigations plan, but we'd love to talk to you about how we're doing our 35 day patch source review. And here's our automation, and here's our controls. And you know, as someone who participated in that interview, I know it was much easier to do show and tell than just saying, here's how we do it and allowing the audit team to see our process. So after we finished our SIP 7 R2, we had SIP 10 R1 the next day and we proposed to the audit team and said, hey, can we do the same thing for our change management program? And that we rolled that into our uh, SIP 10 R1. And so I think just having the opportunity to do a virtual demonstration, I know it may not always be requested from the WEC side, but uh, from NVE, we really appreciate the opportunity to, to show the program and to show the controls in place. Yeah, um, when auditing, one of my favorite questions that I ask at the end of an interview is, is there anything that you would like to showcase that we didn't talk about in this, 
in this interview. And we get a lot of good internal controls and just things that people are so proud of that they've built in their processes um, in that question. So if you were in an interview, please be transparent. Please showcase what you have built into your process because as auditors, we take that back to our oversight planning team and that gets incorporated into your um, compliance risk assessment, um, your compliance oversight plan. Yeah. Um, okay. One other thing that um, that I wanted to say, um, lunch with WEC. One of my colleagues before I came here was like, Stacia, please tell the entities we won't like to have lunch with them, please. And it just goes to show how starved our auditors are for social interaction. So please, if there is an opportunity for that, we we would love the opportunity to have lunch with you. And my colleague Josh Rowe, you guys, he's a very social guy. So. Um, Okay, we are almost done. Feedback to WEC. We appreciate any feedback you have for us during pre-audit, post-audit, any feedback you have, please, please, please give it to us. So we provide a link to the NERC post-audit feedback survey in your, in your closing presentation. And um, a lot of people fill that out, but a lot of people don't. And this is a tool that we use to make improvements. And we have seen improvements of our processes come from feedback from entities. Um, it is encouraged to provide feedback through any um, phase of the audit, and it helps improve WEX processes. I know managers review this feedback, um, so do directors, and it is incredibly helpful. I was on a Delta flight the other day, just coming to this conference, and they said, please provide feedback to us. And I was like, there, you don't really want my feedback. Like I, there's, there's nothing gonna come from me providing feedback, but I assure you that we take your feedback very seriously. We review it. Um, and if there are any issues, then we reach out to you and we try to correct it. So with that said, are there any questions for me or my, my panel up here? I see one question right here. Yes. <clears throat> from BC Hydro. I have a question for the panel and, and you. Uh, maybe on a lighter note, like uh, in, a, in an interview, in an audit interview, uh, you may be facilitating as a, as a compliance you know, team member and the SMEs are sitting and you know the situation is going south. You know, There's about to be a potential non-compliance or at least an area of concern. Um, how did you, you know, deal with that? Like, and like sometimes you can see the SMEs are kind of start a sweat and maybe they start, you know, not having jitter and not have the right response. So how, how did you deal with that, number one? And the second part of the question is like, like what are the, some of the key lessons learned, like, or like the worst moments which you kind of come over, like, like key lessons and say, okay, this is not something we're gonna do again. It's like, if you can, please, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> So if an interview is going south? Yeah, so uh, we did have one experience with that, um, and it wasn't necessarily that the interview was going south, but we had some conflicting answers across some SMEs, and so always feel free to caucus. So I think we had only one official caucus as part of our interview, and that was that, where we put them on mute, and it took us about five minutes to, to arrange the correct answer, find the process, because there were some conflicting questions. And I will add that, to the audit team, it doesn't look bad if you need to caucus. Take the time. We know that interviews are stressful. Take the time and hash it out with your team or ask for a request for information, a DR. Um, any other comments to that answer? Okay, awesome, thank you. And I don't know who is next. Okay. Thanks, uh, Eric Hull with SMUD. Um, I was the crazy one who was clapping during the ERT, you know, our cells are dead comment. Um, Hans, Casey, I'd love to get you guys a drink after this during the social. Um, I just want to reiterate and support that I 100% think that the ERT in a line uh, is far superior than the RSAWs and the RSAWs are dead and I will die on that hill. Um, because it, it, you know, one of the things that SMUD is, you know, we, I think we're one of the first to go through and align audit with WEC in last year. Uh, and we really struggled for months ahead of time as to what are, are we doing, RSAWs, ERT, what have you. And we gauge our audits by how many RFIs we get. So we did, like you, we switched to just using the ERT plus align and, and everything and, and writing out the SEL ID numbers on every, everything along with the ERT ID numbers. And 
Our 2019 audit, we had 20 data requests, 20 RFIs. Our 2022 audit, we had one. So I will be happy to talk to anybody. I'm sure Hans and you know, in case you guys have great information on that, but I think that the ERT in a line is far superior and I th think everybody should be switching to that. And I support Wex move towards that, so. That didn't cost me a lot to have him come up to say that. So thank you. <laughs> here, here, actually. Okay. Um, so uh, just to be clear, so when you, uh, the two SIP guys there on the end, when you re, uh, when you had your actual audit, did they require the RSAWs at all? Did no. you give them anything? No? No. So we, we didn't submit the RSAWs at all. What we did with our RSAWs, because they, the, they're not a lost effort uh, by any means. They're great to adapt for your align narratives. Right. Uh, so you can you can take what he did, trim it down to what makes sense for align, and you're good to go. And then that that's what you maintain. Perfect. Okay, so a second part to that question then. So I, I figured that was your answer and, and, and that follow up the part that you had was right on point here. So when you did the answers to the level one ERT, were you putting in the, you know, for the questions about a procedure plan, whatever, um, were you putting in the latest greatest that was in effect at that time? Or you, were you putting everything, all of them that were in effect during the whole audit period? No, it was just the latest and greatest. And then that seemed to go along with what the spirit of everything was, because what all of our data requests were, even from a level two perspective, were over the previous year. Uh, so it, it really was uh, it, what it appeared like was WEC wanted to know what we're doing now. Uh, so we tried to represent that uh, as much as possible. And then we figured if they wanted to go back a little further in time or wanted more information, they'd, they'd ask that question. Yeah, because that was one of the things I kind of noticed from the the shift from the RSAWs now into the ERTs. The the you know the RSAWs really seem to say for all of the processes and procedures in effect during the audit period, provide them. But the ERTs seem to suggest that it is just what you have in effect right now. Correct. Yeah, it was just the most recent procedure that we provided. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, Stacia, can I go back to that question? Because I think I needed to process it a little bit more. The one of, of how do you handle conflicts on interviews? Because I was having like a, a moment of crisis where I was like, wow, our audit interviews went really smoothly. I was like, how come we didn't have any problems? And a, a large part of that was because we did a peer mock audit. So all of our subject matter experts had practiced ahead of time with um, industry peers where we did actually have some lively interviews in our peer mock audits, just like exchange of information. What do you mean you do that? We don't do that, you know? So that, that was a great trial run, but also I think the reason why we didn't have any conflicts this way around is because we, we really reiterate the partnership aspect and we're like, if you don't understand something that WEC is asking, instead of getting defensive, ask them a question back, seek to understand. Why are you asking this question? And if there's anything that like I look back on and I, I wish we would have done something sooner or better, was asking the questions like our ICDC team, we were like waiting to get asked about it and waiting and we never got asked about it. And we're like, what are you guys doing with all that information we provided? And we were like making up all sorts of assumptions. And then finally we just asked, Stacia and Pat most were like, what did you do with our ice? Well, how are you using this? And they gave a really simple, succinct, positive answer. We're like, why didn't we just ask earlier? Um, so that's kind of, I think, the attitude that had us avoid any of those conflicts of seeking to understand. And and even like, for example, when there were like internal controls, like questions, there were moments where our SMEs are like, that's not part of our scope. You know, and they got real suspicious, like, why are you asking? And they kind of paused and they're like, Wait, I should just ask that. Like, why are you asking this question? Why why do you want to know? And they gave an answer. And it was like, okay, yeah, all right. Now we understand you're trying to understand our controls. So you know, that's a way to avoid conflict is have that mindset going in, that it's not a battle. And like you said, Casey, that was a big change in our audit too, is having um that mentality where it's not us versus them. Um, you're really trying to work together to understand. But I will say, 
even in compliance for 15 years, you do have those scenarios where you just need to pull them apart. And if that ever happens to you, um, just put everybody on mute and say, can we have this call later <laughs> and interrupt the argument. Um, if it's in person and it just politely ask everybody to leave and reschedule the meeting when tempers have calmed. I've never seen that at Tacoma, but just it could happen. Yeah, that's an excellent reminder. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that input. Um, and that is a good place to end for us. And so I think, Maylee, if I am correct, it's break. You are correct. We are on a break and we have desserts in the hall. We have some Rice Krispie treats and some delicious things for you to enjoy. And We'll see you back here shortly.